In the deepest, darkest recesses of that black hole of the internet known as YouTube, there exists a video. The video is of some Eastern European game show, and the basic premise of the game show is that the contestants are all pet owners, they're all dog owners, and the contestants and their dogs are put through any number of trials, and one duo comes out victorious at the end. One of those trials seems relatively simple. The dog is sat at the end of a strip of carpet, and the dog's master is sat at the other end of a strip of carpet, 30 feet away. Sounds simple enough. But the trick is, the trick is that lining the two sides of this strip of carpet are all sorts of enticing things. Squeaky toys, chew toys, little bits of hot dog cut up and put in a bowl. All manner of very enticing things to a dog. And you can see how this is about to go. All the dog has to do is walk 30 feet to its master at the other end. The task, nearly impossible. Because every two inches, it cannot help but to be distracted by the far more enticing, the far more delicious, the far more pleasing toy or item of food to its right or to its left. It gets distracted. Its master yells or whistles or calls. It comes back to attention, takes two more steps, and just gets distracted again and again and again. Without the distractions, this trip should probably take about five seconds, but with the distractions, it takes about five minutes. Friends, this image, this image of constantly being distracted by the more immediate, the more flashy, the more somewhat delicious thing that's present to us, and losing sight of the master who's calling us at the end of the journey, Really, it's not just a thing for dogs. It frankly describes our journey in the Christian life each and every day. The master beckons. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to heaven. But we as human beings struggle to see and remain attentive to that call because there are any number of things in our life that feel more proximate and appear to be more entertaining, more pleasing, more delicious. And time and time again, our eyes will move from the Lord to whatever those things are. Money and wealth, fame and power, adulation and praise. Whatever those temptations are in life, they will distract us over and over and over again. And each time, God will call us back to himself over and over and over again. Every time we get distracted, every time we lose our focus to sin and temptation, God re-invites us to remember his love to remember his goodness, to remember his promise, to reorient our gaze to him so that we might take a few more steps closer to him in this life. This is the entire story of our salvation. We're told in today's first reading from the book of Genesis that God has made this promise to his people from nearly the very beginning. I will be your God and you will be my people. And we'll do this together. And we know full well that the people of Israel struggle. They struggle to remember that promise. They struggle to remember that relationship. And time and time again, strayed from the ways of the Lord. Same is true for our apostles, for the disciples in today's gospel. The transfiguration comes in a very unique spot in the Gospels. It comes after Jesus' 
first prediction of his passion and right before he begins his journey to Jerusalem, his journey to Calvary. It's the reason why we as a church always read this gospel on the second Sunday of Lent as we journey closer to Calvary, as we ready ourselves over the next four weeks to prepare to mark and to honor the Lord's passion and death so that we might joyfully celebrate his resurrection. Jesus knows that the disciples will be tested. He knows that their faith will be put to the ultimate test. And in this moment, in this moment when he gives them just a glimmer, just a foretaste of the glory that is to come, he seeks to help them remember just who he is. So that when the hour of trial comes, they might have something to cling to. They'll be prevented from complete and absolute despair. Jesus tries, but of course we fail. Peter is here. He's a witness to the resurrection, to the transfiguration. Yet we know in just a few short weeks, he will betray the Lord and deny him three times. John will be at the foot of the cross, but both James and John will go into hiding, thinking that the cross was the end. One has to wonder, one has to wonder as John was standing there at the foot of the cross watching his Lord and Savior expire, if he thought about this moment and just maybe, just maybe had a glimmer of hope that that moment would not be the end. One wonders if Peter and James, while watching their Savior and Lord and friend dragged through the streets, jeered by the crowds, nailed to the cross, if they too thought about this moment, if their complete and utter despair was tempered by the possibility that this moment meant that there was a story larger than their own, larger than what they knew or understood. One wonders if the three of them, as they took the dead and lifeless body of their savior and friend off the cross and laid it in the tomb, had some glimmer of hope that the one who had been transfigured before them, the one in whom the Father was well pleased, might be able to conquer death, death itself. We know they struggled. We know they doubted. But we also know they trusted in the power of the resurrection when they encountered the Lord again. And just like then, Jesus gives us a glimpse of his glory. Each and every time we gather around this altar for Eucharist, each and every time we receive the fullness of his mercy and the sacrament of confession, each and every time we experience his glory and love in the sacraments, each and every time we enter into relationship with him in prayer, in scripture, meditating on the glory of his creation, the beauty of his son, the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset, in all of those moments and throughout our life, God gl gives us glimpses of the divine, glimpses of his promise, so that like those first disciples, we too might have hope in his love and power, even when we find ourselves the deepest and darkest depths of our life, even when we're tempted to despair, even when we want to convince ourselves that sin will always be the end of our story and there's no chance for growth and holiness. Every time we fall, every time we fail, God calls us to remember 
once again to remember his goodness, to remember his might, to remember his promise. And yes, we will be distracted two feet further into the future, but over and over again, we will journey closer to him. And he will aid us on making that long and final trip to his heavenly home so that we might share life with him, not only in this world, but eternally in the next.